to meet the needs of an aging population and the challenges of a global economy. Mr. President, cup, cap, and balance does none of these things, and so I urge my colleagues respectfully to reject this misguided measure. The Majority Leader. Mr. President, Paul, the distinguished Chairman of the Appropriations Committee was talking. I had a visit with some of the pages here to ask them did they realize who was speaking. And they all knew who he was. They knew that he was a heroic man having the Medal of Honor. They knew he had been elected to the Senate nine different times, in addition to serving in the House of Representatives. So it's great that our pages are so uh, versed on what happens around here. We depend on them very, very much. And I'm grateful that um, they understand what a great man the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee is. Uh, Mr. President, I ask you to ask consent the Senate proceed to consideration of calendar number 76, bill to extend the term of the incumbent director of the FBI, that the committee substitute amendment be considered, that a Coburn amendment, which the desk be agreed to, the committee substitute amendment as amended be agreed to, the bill as amended be read a third time, and the Senate proceed to vote on passage of the bill as amended. The motion to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Any statements related to the bill be placed in the record at the appropriate places of read. Further, that if Robert Mueller III is nominated to be director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the nom nomination be placed directly on the executive calendar that at a time be determined by the majority leader in consultation with the Republican leader. The Senate proceed to executive session to consider the nomination. There will be two hours of debate, equally divided in the usual form. That upon the use or leading back of that time, the Senate proceed to vote with no intervening action or debate on the nomination. The motion to reconsider be considered made and laid on the table with no intervening action or debate, and then no further motion is be in order to the nomination. These statements related to the nomination be printed in the record that the President be immediately notified of the Senate's action and the Senate then resume legislative session. Is there objection? Hearing no objection, it is so ordered. Mr. President, I want to extend my appreciation to Senators Leahy and Grassley for working together to get this matter done. He's done a wonderful job for 10 years, and the country feels they need him for two more years, and he's agreed to take that, and I appreciate that very much. Under the previous order, the foregoing actions as with respect to the bill are accomplished. The clerk will read the bill for the third time. Calendar number 76, S1103, a bill to extend the term of the incumbent director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The question is on the passage of the bill as amended. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The bill as amended is passed. President. The Senator from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to speak on behalf of the resolution before us, this so-called cut, cap, and balance resolution, and explain briefly why it represents a better approach uh, to resolving the financial crisis that uh, our country is faced with than the alternative, which seems to be myopically focused on raising taxes, as if our problem in this country were taxes. Our problem is spending. And that's why the reference to cutting spending, capping future spending, and ensuring that we never go back to our errant ways by passing a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, which would forever prevent us from getting into the same position we are now, where we have to keep coming back to increase the nation's debt ceiling. That's why the emphasis on spending. 
Now, some of our friends on the other side of the aisle, and certainly the President of the United States, says, I will not agree to anything unless you raise taxes. Why are Republicans so um, opposed to the President's approach? Why are we focused on reducing spending rather than raising taxes? Why is it important? First of all, because spending is the problem, not taxes. Spending in this country under President Obama has gone from the historic level of about 20 percent of our gross domestic product to now 25 percent in just three short years. That's a historic growth in spending. We've never been this high. And under the Obama budgets, as far as the eye can see, we're going to be above the historic levels, never below, I believe, 23 percent of the gross domestic product, and as far as I can see, very close to that 25 percent. Spending is the problem. Now, some will say, well, the government has collected less income taxes in the last couple of years. That's true. But it isn't because tax rates have changed. We've had the same tax rates for the last decade. They've been constant. The only reason there, are, there is less revenue coming into the Treasury right now, the so-called tax take of the government, is because the economy is in the tank. People are unemployed. They're not working. They're not making as much money. Businesses are not making as much money, so they're not paying as much in taxes. So what's the answer? To raise tax rates and try to squeeze more blood out of this turnip? To try to get more out of a sick economy? No. The answer, of course, is to try to get the economy well again. So people are working. They do make more money. Businesses make money. They all pay more in taxes. And then we'll be back at the historic levels of tax take by the federal government. And uh, presumably, uh, folks who say, well, taxes are the problem, will then be satisfied. But how do you grow the economy? How do you get it well? We know one thing for sure not to do, and that's impose taxes on an already weak economy. The President himself, last December, when we reached agreement between the Congress and the President on extending all of the current tax rates, made that exact point. He said to raise taxes at this time, when the economy is weak, would be the worst thing for economic growth and job creation. He was right. He was right then. If anything, our economy is in worse shape now. Now we're at 9.2 percent of unemployment. We continue to stagnate. And if you've got a sick economy, the last thing you want to do is impose more taxes on that economy. One of our colleagues here in the Senate, our colleague from the state uh, in which I was born, the Cornhusker state of Nebraska, Ben Nelson, said, and I quote, raising taxes at a time when our economy remains fragile takes us in the wrong direction. If we start with plans to raise taxes, pretty soon spending cuts will fall by the wayside. And I couldn't agree with him more. I think there is some bipartisan consensus, though certainly I recognize many Democrats would like to raise taxes, but I think economists and, uh, and most Americans appreciate that when the problem is spending, when spending has gone up so dramatically, the answer is to reduce the spending, get it back down at a minimum to where it was and not raise taxes. The second reason that we are focused on the spending side and why we therefore support the cutting of spending, the capping of that spending, and making sure that uh, we have the constraint of a constitutional amendment to restrain us from our impulses in the future, is because it never fails that tax hikes always hit more than the people you're aiming at. It doesn't just hit the millionaires and billionaires. It hits a lot of other people. When the alternative minimum tax was created, the idea was to make sure that, and I could be a little wrong on the number, Mr. President, I think it was 125 millionaires couldn't use deductions and credits to get out of paying their taxes. We were going to create an alternative minimum tax. They'd have to pay some tax even if they had lots of credits and deductions that they could take. Well, today, uh, I know, uh, what, two years ago, it was going to hit 23 million Americans. I think this year it's something like 32 million. Again, I could be a little bit wrong on the number, but let's just say between 20 and 30 million people. So we started out with about 125, and now that tax hits well over 20, and I think over 30 million households a year. Why wouldn't we um, want to do something about that? We do every year. We pass what we call a patch so that it doesn't affect those people because we never intended to affect them in the first place. We aimed at the millionaires 
and we hit over 20 million other Americans. And the same thing would happen here. How many millionaires and billionaires are there? To say households that report income taxes of above a million dollars. Well, the answer is 319,000. In the whole United States, 319,000. How many people would actually pay the increased tax in the upper two brackets where these people are located? Well, that number turns out to be 3.6 million people right now. What will it be in 20 years? We'll probably be up into the 20 and 30 million category again. So the point is, you aim at 300,000 people and you end up hitting 10 times that many people. 300, excuse me, 3.6 million people. That's how many people there are in the top two brackets that the president's proposals would hit. There's another unintended consequence. It doesn't just hit the millionaires and billionaires. It hits small business owners. Small businesses create two-thirds of all of the jobs coming out of an economic downturn like we've had, out of a recession. And small businesses usually, or at least 50 percent of the small business income, let's put it that way, is reported in these top two income tax brackets. You have an individual person. He's not a corporation. So he reports his income taxes in one of the two top income tax brackets. Now what happens when you raise the tax on those 50% of the folks, the small business folks? Are they more likely to hire or are they more likely to just sit on their hands? Obviously the answer is they're not going to hire more people. And earlier this week I quoted from several small business folks who of course said precisely that. Experts all agree on this. When you raise taxes on the top two rates, you hit a lot of small businesses. And one of the taxes that the president proposed raising, as a matter of fact, his own small business administration did a study and reported that that tax, and I'm quoting now, could, for, could ultimately force many small businesses to close. Could ultimately force many small businesses to close. So you aim at the millionaire and the billionaire and you end up hitting small businesses. By the way, since this Small Business Administration report has been in the news, I've noticed the administration's not talking about this particular tax anymore. Well, that's fine. But the reality is that the others that they're talking about would also hit small business and force many of them to close. Who else gets hit by this tax on millionaires and billionaires? We have some, ex uh, some uh, experience Back in 1990, we thought that we would impose a luxury tax on the millionaires and billionaires. We were going to tax things like yachts and, and jewelry and luxury items and so on. Well, that lasted a little less than three years when all the people that made the boats, made the yachts, marched on Washington and said, hey, you just put us out of business. And we repealed that tax. I think it was over 9,000 people were put out of business. And it's interesting. That same proposition translates to today. What was one of the provisions in the stimulus bill? Now, the stimulus bill was opposed by all but, I think, two Republicans. All the Democrats supported it. Well, it was the tax treatment for corporate jets. Republicans didn't support this special tax treatment for corporate jets, but the president did. It was in his stimulus bill because it was thought that this would help to create or save jobs accelerated depreciation, which is the tax treatment here, was beneficial to the people who make these airplanes, more beneficial from a tax standpoint, and it might well be that jobs were either created or saved as a result of that. But that tax provision that was so important to creating or saving jobs when the stimulus bill was passed, now all of a sudden is something that's evil because presumably people that fly in business jets are, are uh, people to be attacked, to be demagogued. And you've heard the President of the United States talk about this. He talks about the special tax loophole for corporate jets. Well, it's his tax loophole. And he put it in there because he thought it would create or save jobs. Now, who's it going to hurt? People, the business guys will still fly in their corporate jets. It's just that the jets will cost more money. But probably fewer people will be working making those planes. Now, is that good policy or bad policy? I'm all for having that debate. I'm not going to defend the corporate jets. 
I will defend the people that make them. But let's have that debate in the context of tax reform that we've all said we're for doing, so that if we decide it is good policy to eliminate that accelerated depreciation provision, we do that, and then we apply the savings to reducing tax rates overall, which is exactly what the President said we should do. In his State of the Union speech, he pointed out that America is not competitive with the rest of the world. We have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. And he said, we've got to get it down. And what we ought to do is eliminate loopholes in the tax code, and with the savings that we have then, reduce overall corporate rates. So instead of paying 35 percent, our corporations would pay maybe 20 or 25 percent, which is still above the world average of developed countries, but at least we'd be more competitive. So what's the right policy here? Should we be demagoguing corporate jets, or should we think through the policy? We might just be hurting regular Americans here and think twice about the kind of uh, political language that we're using. Even oil and gas, we have to tax the big oil companies. Everybody knows you put this tax on, and next thing you know, you're going to be paying more tax when you fill up your car at the uh, local service station. So think through who you're really going to hit with these taxes on millionaires and billionaires and big corporations, even the death tax. The death tax is part of the taxes the president would like to have rates go up on, to go back to the 45 percent rate. That's almost half, 45 percent on the estates. Now, a lot of these estates are small businesses, farms, and ranches. And a lot of times they have to sell all or part of the business or the farm or the ranch in order to pay the estate tax. So who are you really hurting when you do this? I've got a friend who had a small printing business in Phoenix, and he was one of the largest charitable givers in our community, a fine, wonderful man. His name was Jerry Wasotsky. He created the business from nothing, moved out from New York City, had over 200 employees when he died. He had boys and girls clubs named after him. He and his family contributed as much money to charity in Phoenix as, as anybody that I know. Well, they had to sell the business because the estate taxes were eating them up. The uh, out-of-state uh, company that bought the business didn't contribute to the local community. They didn't contribute to charity. Um, who got hurt when we imposed that estate tax, that death tax, on Jerry's family? So let's just stop and think. One reason we don't want to focus on taxes, we'd rather focus on spending here, is because a lot of times when you focus on the millionaires and billionaires, you end up hurting a lot of other people instead. And the third reason, and frankly the most important from an economic standpoint, of course, is the fact that tax hikes kill job creation and, econ and economic growth. And I alluded to this in the, in the second point that I made. Fifty-four percent of all of our jobs are from small businesses. And when you hurt small businesses' ability to hire people, obviously you're hurting families, you're creating more unemployment, and you're preventing the economy from rebounding. I mentioned the fact that the top two brackets of our income tax code is where at least half of all of the small business uh, income is reported and taxes are paid. That's one of the areas where the administration wants to increase taxes. Why would you do this? As the Small Business Administration says, when it would force many uh, small businesses or could force uh, many small businesses to close. It doesn't make sense. And that's why we're focused on cutting spending, capping that spending over time, and ensuring that those caps stay in place through a balanced budget amendment. The uh, American people, I think, have an understanding of this. There have been a lot of polls uh, quoted lately. I just wanted to refer to one, which is only a week old. It's the Rasmussen poll from last Thursday. And the question was asked um, whether uh, there should be a tax hike included in any legislation to raise the debt ceiling? Pretty straightforward question. Rasmussen is a very reputable pollster. Just one week ago, most voters said no. Uh, only 34 percent thought that a tax hike should be included. 55 percent disagreed, said it should not. Um, among those affiliated with neither political party, the so-called independents, 35 percent favored it, 51 percent, a majority, opposed including a tax hike in the legislation to raise the debt ceiling. So we're with the American people on this. It isn't necessary. Taxes aren't the problem. 
It affects a lot more people than they ever uh, think it will. And finally, if you want to really hurt economic growth, if you want to really kill job creation, then just pile more taxes on the economy. It doesn't make sense. And that, Mr. President, is why we are so insistent on supporting legislation that would cut spending rather than raising taxes. Mr. President, Senator from Kansas. Uh, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent uh, for two things. I ask unanimous consent that Jarrah settles an intern and my staff have floor pr privileges for the rest of the day. And I also ask unanimous consent to address the Senate for up to 10 minutes. Without objection. I'm Mr. Both. President, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, yesterday I was on the Senate floor talking about. Uh, this piece of legislation that's now pending before the United States Senate, passed by the House of Representatives earlier this week. Uh, I am a sponsor and supporter of cut, cap, and balance and believe that it is a path toward responsibility that we need to demonstrate here in the United States Senate, here in the Congress, and here in America. Uh, Mr. President, it um, seems to me that it would be, it's certainly irresponsible not to raise the debt ceiling, but it's equally or more irresponsible not to raise the debt ceiling uh, without making adjustments in the way we do business in Washington, D.C., and clearly cutting spending is a component of that. Uh, capping spending is a portion of our national economy, uh, returning it to the days in which, uh, just a few years ago, in which we were spending only 18, I say only in quotes perhaps, only 18 percent of our gross national product uh, by the federal government. Uh, unfortunately, in the last few years, that 18 percent has grown to 25 percent, 24.2 percent. Uh, and so reducing some spending, capping that spending uh, in the intermediate future so that it doesn't uh, exceed a certain portion of the national economy, and finally passing a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution seems to me to be a reasonable, rational approach to solving the problems that we face. I also indicated yesterday that in my view, there's a fourth component. It's cut, cap, balance, and grow. And uh, I don't want us to forget the importance of a growing economy. Uh, the last time we had uh, our budget that was uh, in balance, close to being in balance, was at the end of the term of President Clinton. And uh, yes, there was some spending restraint back in those days, in those years. Uh, Republicans and Democrats couldn't get together and pass major pieces of legislation that increased spending. And so that spending restraint was an important component. But the other part of that is the economy was growing, and people were working, and as a result, they were paying taxes. Uh, and that is the more enjoyable uh, component of our work here. Uh, in addition to restraining spending, uh, capping its uh, percentage of the economy, uh, and putting a balanced budget in, in place so that we don't get back in the mess that we're in, uh, the, the other aspect of that is to make sure that we make the policy decisions here uh, in our nation's capital that allow a business person, an employer, to make the decision, now is the time to invest in plant and equipment, now is the time to add additional employees, uh, and yet there are so many aspects of decisions that have been made in our nation's capital over a long period of time that now come together and discourage an individual business owner and a potential employer from making the decision that uh, I'm going to invest in the economy. We've all heard the numbers about the uh, amount of money sitting on the sidelines in the, in the U.S. economy. And in my view, the recession that we're in has lingered longer than necessary because there is so much uncertainty uh, in regard to what's going to happen next. And a large portion of that in, in uncertainty comes from the inability to predict what policy decisions are going to be made here in the United States Senate, across the hall in the House, uh, and what uh, the uh, Obama administration is going to propose and potentially put in place uh, in regard to rules and regulations. So uh, I certainly hope that uh, my colleagues uh, here in the Senate will take the proposal by the House of Representatives as serious work. Uh, I certainly agree that there can be negotiations had. Uh, there's been, as I indicated yesterday, some concern about the specific language of the constitutional amendment that requires a balanced budget. 
and we ought not to draw the line in the sand and say that it has to be exactly the way that it's written. Uh, let's come together and work to find a reasonable, rational solution based upon the outline that this legislation provides. Uh, at, from time to time, it's been considered a, a radical piece of legislation labeled that way, uh, and yet so many of the things that, uh, that we do in our everyday lives that states across our nation uh, encounter and, and the way that they conduct business are certainly uh, capsulized in uh, cut, cap, and balance. Uh, I know there's been significant talk about raising uh, taxes. Uh, I heard the, the senator from Arizona speak to this before uh, uh, just a few moments ago. And, uh, you know, when an individual is uh, struggling to pay the bills, uh, we don't often have the opportunity to ask for a pay raise. What we do at home, what we should do in our own lives, is to reduce our spending levels. Uh, and uh, simply asking for more money to meet our current uh, obligations is, is not usually an option. Uh, and it goes, that, that tax issue goes along with my comments uh, just a moment ago about the importance of uh, growing the economy. Uh, and too often we, we look at uh, taxes as a source of revenue. I'm, I'm for raising revenue, but I'm for raising revenue by a growing economy and people being at work paying those taxes, not by raising the tax rates, but by improving the economy and allowing good things to happen to, to uh, families, uh, individuals, and businesses across the country. Uh, and so that tax code is an important component of this uh, issue of growing our economy and getting our deficit uh, back in, in line, back with some level of uh, responsible behavior here. And the, the additional point that I want to make, uh, in, in addition to what I, I have said already today, but also what I said yesterday to the Senate, uh, is uh, this is the one-year anniversary of the passage of Dodd-Frank. Uh, huge financial regulations were put in place by legislation just a year ago today that were passed by the House and, and Senate signed by President Obama. And in my view, that legislation is another component of the, the difficulty in knowing what's coming down the road. Hundreds of regulations yet to be proposed, pursued, and enacted, uh, and so many of our businesses and financial institutions don't know what to expect and therefore again waiting to see what happens uh, to the federal government what what decisions are made here in this case not by congress now but by regulators uh, up the up the street here in our nation's capital and so on this anniversary of the passage of that legislation uh, i want to again highlight to what i think uh, is a common sense uh, reform uh, to that legislation. A part of Dodd-Frank created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, and a number of us senators uh, have signed a, a letter to President Obama trying to make clear that before a uh, head of that uh, bureau is going to be confirmed by the United States Senate, we believe that structural reform, change in the nature of that organization needs to occur. And again, I, I, these seem very straightforward and common sense to me, but rather than have a single uh, head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, I would ask that, uh, in, in fact, I've introduced legislation to do this, and my colleagues in signing that letter ask the President to help us change that individual to a board or commission, similar to other government agencies charged with financial oversight, so that the power does not rest in a sole individual. Uh, and then, again, to, one would think Congress would never want to give up the authority to determine the appropriations for this agency, uh, and instead uh, the legislation, uh, the law as currently written, uh, provides for a, a draw against the Federal Reserve as compared to an agency, like almost all agencies have to come to Congress, have to come and ask for their appropriation, gives us as legislators, me as a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, as ranking member of the Financial Services Subcommittee, on appropriations, the opportunity to review, to have input, to provide oversight. Uh, and we ought to change that uh, formula by which uh, the money comes directly from the Federal Reserve and put it back in the, in the, with the responsibility of this Congress making those decisions. And finally, we want to have banking regulators who oversee the safety and soundness of our financial institutions today, that they be given meaningful input uh, into the Bureau's operation, uh, all designed to provide greater uh, opportunity for us as members of Congress, for the American people, to have input and oversight over what will be one of the largest agencies, most powerful regulators 
uh, in our country's history and certainly having significant uh, input, uh, having surf uh, I'm sorry, significant um, creation of new rules and regulations that are going to in some fashion uh, affect the U.S. economy. Um, many of my community banks uh, feel so overregulated today. There's a real concern or fear about making loans today, something that's very important for an economic recovery, that, that aspect of growing the economy, because they don't know what the next set of regulations are going to be. And in fact, for the, for the passage of Dodd-Frank, the legislation that, uh, that, we sell, that we are now observing the one-year anniversary of it becoming law, the GAO, our Government Accountability Office, estimates that the budgetary costs of Dodd-Frank will exceed $1.25 billion. Uh, in addition to that, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that over the next 10 years, Dodd-Frank will, will take $27 billion directly from the U.S. economy in new fees and assessments on lenders and other financial uh, companies. Uh, so as we look at the legislation that's pending before us, cut, cap, and balance, my hope is that we will expand uh, once we pass that legislation, we will get back to aggressively pursuing a pro-job, pro-growth uh, agenda. And jobs certainly are important for us in, in generating the revenues necessary to fund the federal government and to reduce our national debt. But there's nothing more important to Americans, to Kansans across uh, our state, than being able to have uh, a secure opportunity for employment, to put food on their families' tables, to save for their own retirement and their children's education. Uh, and I do believe, uh, seriously believe, that a significant message that was delivered by the American people in the election of, of uh, November 2010 was the reminder to us that we have the responsibility. Again, government's not a creator of jobs, but we are the creator of an environment in which the private sector can create jobs. And so uh, let's cut, cap, balance, grow the economy, uh, strengthen uh, the opportunity for every American to have uh, a valuable and viable job uh, with the hope of uh, improvement in their own lives and most importantly make certain that we pass on to the next generation of Americans the ability to pursue that American dream. Uh, Mr. President, I thank you for the opportunity of addressing the Senate and uh, I would note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
suspended. Without objection. Mr. President, I rise today to um, uh, talk about the bill that's before the, the Senate today, but as a part of that, uh, we are now in the midst of a true fiscal crisis in this country, and I want to address something that um, uh, has been debated over the last several days, discussed over the last several days, criticized over the last several days, and been the uh, object of a lot of misinformation by colleagues on my side of the aisle, particularly about the uh, proposal that has been submitted by the so-called Gang of Six, of which I happen to be a member, and uh, someone who for the last seven months has participated in discussions with um, uh, two of my colleagues on our side of the aisle as well as three on the other side of the aisle to try to find a bipartisan solution to being able to repay the $14.3 trillion that our federal government owes and that we have all participated in creating. And the misinformation that's going around from my friends is very disturbing because people are here on this floor throwing out numbers uh, that are wrong, giving uh, specifics on a piece of legislation that has not even been written, and yet they're talking like they're experts on the subject of a matter that my five colleagues and I have been discussing, debating among ourselves for the last six months, and we haven't even put the legislation out there yet. So it's really pretty disturbing to me that there are some people in this body that want to see nothing done, and I assume want us to continue down the road of borrowing 40 cents out of every dollar that we are spending, and I'm not willing to do that. I think that we were sent here with a commitment from our constituents to solve the serious problems that this country faces. The only way we're going to solve this fiscal problem that we have is to generate 60 votes in this body in support of some proposal. Uh, I'm going to talk in support of the proposal that we have under consideration now because I think it is a potential solution, and I'm very appreciative of the authors of the cut, cap, and balance bill. I'm, I'm appreciative of our leadership for at least trying to come forward with something and put it on the table to give us the opportunity to debate those ideas. I think uh, there have been a number of very positive proposals that, uh, uh, that have come forward and hopefully that, that will come forward in the next few days to uh, allow us to debate this issue and to primarily solve the problem relative to the debt ceiling and solve the problem relative to the long-term debt that we have. But I will have to say I really am disturbed about uh, some of the comments and statements, uh, even from folks who are critical of the plan that we put forward for cutting too much in spending. And these are the folks who have been ranting and raving about the fact that we are spending too much money in this town, and now they're complaining about the fact that we're cutting too much in spending. I, I, um, um, I look forward to continuing this debate, and uh, I just want to say that the proposal that we put forward was intended from day one to be a, a, a framework, not the final product, but a framework for this body as well as the House to discuss as a way forward for solving the issue of how we're going to repay this $14.3 trillion. We never, ever intended for it to be a, in, a, in the mix on solving the issue of the debt ceiling that's, that needs to be raised, according to the Department of Treasury, by August the 2nd. Because we happen to come to a conclusion of our negotiations this week at the same time that the debate on, on the debts, raising the debt ceiling is reaching its height has obviously created some impression on some folks that our proposal is intended to solve the issue of the debt ceiling, and it's not. It categorically is not, and I want to make that perfectly clear. That being said, if there is any part of our agreement, any part of our principles, that can be utilized by the leadership of the House and the Senate to figure out a way forward on the debt ceiling, 
for. We have no pride of authorship, and, and we hope leadership will take advantage of anything that can be used to try to generate the necessary support um, in this body as well as in the Senate, uh, excuse me, as well as in the House, uh, to solve this issue of, of this deadline that we're facing on August 2nd. Um, Mr. President, I do, uh, as I say, I rise in full support of the cut, cap, and balance legislation. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of this bill. I commend my fellow senators in this chamber who have taken it upon themselves to offer solutions to the large and growing problem of our debt and our deficit. A majority of Republicans here in the Senate, as well as a majority of those in the House, believe that legislation that cuts government spending and places tough enforcement mechanisms on the federal budget is the right way to bring spending under control. I'm also co-sponsor of a separate balanced budget amendment proposal. I firmly believe that all of these proposals will structure and control the federal government spending just as Americans have demanded. We're in the middle of a fiscal crisis. Last year, the government spent at a rate of 25% of our gross domestic product and took in revenues of about 14.5% of our gross domestic product. The result of that is that last year, for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2010, we had in excess of a $1.5 trillion deficit. It looks like we're headed in that same direction this year, and that is totally unsustainable. Our financial markets have told us that. The folks who sell our, are, are in the process of putting together another sale of our bonds have told us that. And we know that the people who are looking at buying those bonds are looking very closely at how this body acts over the next several days. Some people have said that the bond market is the most honest financial market out there, as the bond market tends to track truest to the debtor's overall fiscal standing. The bond rating agencies have already told us that we are approaching, you know, approaching the edge of what the market will bear. We are close to the brink of our self-imposed debt limit of $14.3 trillion. We must give serious, solemn consideration to any plan that will turn us immediately away from our overspending. We need to be mindful of the consequences of a default. Forcing the administration to make spending decisions is only one problem we face. A default in the subsequent rise in interest rates means we will find ourselves deeper in debt and rampant inflation will prevent us from achieving fiscal solvency. Current levels of discretionary and mandatory spending cannot be sustained. And Mr. President, I say that with respect to every area of the federal government. We cannot allow any area of the federal government to go untouched because if we do, then we will allow that area of our government to continue to grow and be out of control. We must cut federal spending anywhere we can and in every department of the federal government. Mr. President, we also have to reform entitlements. We have to look at the issues that are very difficult for a lot of us to deal with, and we have to make some very tough decisions. Too frequently we have we engaged in political theater instead of earnest efforts to resolve these long-term budget issues. The American people expect and deserve an honest budget debate and an honest budget process. On Tuesday of this week, the House made a historic vote. Its members decided that Congress can no longer feign interest in securing our financial future. They took the right step of voting to cut spending and place rigid caps on remaining expenditures with tough budget enforcement mechanisms, and I commend them for their efforts. Now is the time to join our colleagues in the House. We must look for new ways of ensuring that Congress cannot break promises. The best path forward towards fiscal stability will set a firm foundation, and this legislation will do exactly that. George Washington gave clear guidance when he told the House of Representatives that no consideration is more urgent than the regular redemption and discharge of the public debt. We can no longer allow the American people to suffer by not providing the economic basis for recovery and growth. The equation is simple. A balanced federal budget that is free of excessive debt leads to a healthy economy 
and a sustainable job creation activity. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President, Senator from Georgia. Mr. President, I rise today in support of House Resolution 2560, Cut, Cap, and Balance. I've been watching the debate on my TV back in the office this afternoon, listening to the arguments made pro and con, and thinking to myself that back home in Georgia, there are a lot of folks that I live around my house that are scratching their head if they're watching this debate. They're wondering why cut, cap, and balance is such a bad idea because, Mr. President, they've had to cut, they've had to cap, they've had to balance. The call I left before I came here to speak on the floor was from a minister and his wife that I know. They are retired. Both of their daughters are married and live away from Georgia. Both of them have been in financial difficulty. Both of them are on the brink of losing their homes. But through the counseling of the minister and their support, they counseled and showed them where to cap, where to cut, and where to balance, so they couldn't make their mortgage payments and not lose their homes. Americans all over the country are having to do that. They've had to do it. The economic recession that we're in has mandated, and you know, there are no excuses with IRS or with bill collectors or with people who you may do business with, if you don't pay, there are consequences. America, as a country, must ask of itself what we impose and ask of every citizen in our country. I think also there are probably a lot of members of the Georgia legislature that are watching this debate, and they're scratching their head. Because in my state, in the last four years, we cut $5 billion from a $22 billion budget to a $17 billion budget. You know why we've cut? Because our Constitution says you've got to have a balanced budget. You can't borrow to pay for everyday operations. And you must live within your means. And as our revenues have gone down in the recession, we've had to cut. And yes, a lot of those cuts have been painful. But many of the states now are coming back. There was an article just the other day about the number of states coming back that are showing future, break, future months of growth in their revenue, growth in their income, and even looking to surpluses that will come in the years to come. Why? Because when they had to do it, they balanced their budget, they capped their expenditures, and they did what their Constitution requires. This proposal tells us, first of all, to make cuts that would materialize early on at about $51 billion, but would be a down payment on a process to continue the cutting process to reduce our deficit and over time our debt. And it has a formula for capping our expenditures in the future, going from 21.7 percent of GDP to 19.9 percent of GDP, which, by the way, Mr. President, falls within the realm of the last 40-year averages until the last few years where we've gone from 20 to 22 to 24 percent to 24.6 percent of GDP. It is not unreasonable to ask us to impose upon ourselves a cap that is consistent with the averages of our past. And remember this, Mr. President, as we get our arms around our spending, as we live within our means, business will prosper, revenues will go up to companies, taxes will go up to us, and that percentage of GDP will give you a broader margin. It's only when you're in a declining economy, a recessionary environment where revenues go down, that caps are really hurting you a lot because you're hurting yourself, you're not empowering business, profits go down, revenues go down to the country. And then on the balanced budget amendment, this provision leaves room for negotiation between bodies as to what the caps would be in the balanced budget amendment, whether it would be a supermajority of 60 or 67 to raise taxes. It's a realistic approach to cause us to sit around the table of Congress and negotiate what's right for the country. If it's right for almost every state in our union to have to balance their budget, to cap their spending, and to limit their borrowing, it should be right for us. This proposal is right for America. It's basically what we require of our citizens. It's now time we require it of ourselves. So I am proud to join with my fellow members of the Republican Conference in the United States Senate to vote for a new discipline for America that cuts excessive spending, caps wasteful spending, and over time allows us a roadmap to, to have a balanced budget and a GDP ratio to debt, a GDP ratio to expenditures that is doable, is workable, and is historically justifiable. Mr. President, I yield back my time. Yeah, Mr. President, Senator from Oklahoma. Mr. President, uh, ask me this because then I'll be uh, um, 
recognized for uh, 15 minutes is in morning business. Without objection. Uh, Mr. President, uh, first of all, let me just make a uh, comment on something totally unrelated to the subject of the day, and that is that we have a very significant bill that's coming up that the, the occupier of the chair and I have put together. It's called the Pilot's Bill of Rights. And the reason I want to say something about it, getting toward the end of the week right now, is that it happens that a week from today, the largest gathering any time, any place in the world, of pilots to get together at Oshkosh for the big event. I have been going for 32 consecutive years. We have probably the most significant single piece of legislation that we've ever introduced uh, uh, at Oshkosh. And we're going to have literally thousands. I'm talking about 200,000 pilots. These are single issue people. I've been a pilot for 50 years and I know how these people think. The Pilots Bill of Rights is going to offer an opportunity to these people who might be accused of something to have access to the evidence. And it's something that, they, that everyone's for. As a matter of fact, and it's something that you may, uh, I haven't said yet, but I just heard that the, uh, the air traffic controllers are supporting this effort. So we're going to have a lot of people. We already have 34 uh, co-sponsors. And the reason I want to say, and I, I know not many members are listening right now, but a lot of staffers are, pilots are single issue people. And uh, they're going to want to know who is co-sponsor of this bill when we get up there. We'll be talking for a period of two hours at two different uh, settings. And we'll have thousands, literally thousands of the pilots there. And so I encourage very strongly uh, uh, people who may be listening to us right now the, to have their members uh, look at this very carefully. Because, uh, as I say, pilots are single-issue people, and this is their issue, and it's something that's good. I did this twice before, once in 1994, when we were able to use the population at Oshkosh to push over the top the first product liability bill that changed our, major, our, our, our manufacturing of aircraft from a major importer to a major exporter. It all happened at Oshkosh. Another time it happened was with Bob Hoover. I think I could safely say would be considered to be perhaps the best pilot in America today. He's up in years, but this guy's a, and uh, he had a problem that we helped him with. It was an emergency revocation, and we did it in Oshkosh. So I just hope that uh, we get a lot more people that are interested in general aviation, and particularly if you're on the general aviation uh, caucus you, and you're not on this bill, there are going to be an awful lot of questions. Uh, Mr. President, let me just make a few comments about the cut cap and, and uh, balance. Uh, I can remember coming down to this floor, standing at this podium, uh, just a little over, a fifth, about 15 years ago. This is back during the Clinton administration. And I came down here because the Clinton budget for the entire country at that time was one and a half trillion dollars. And I came down to the, and stood here and I said, how is it possible to sustain a level like, 100, like uh, one and a half trillion dollars? That was to run the United States of America for the entire year of 1996. Now, I think the outrage this year is that in President Obama's current budget, the deficit alone was $1.65 trillion. In other words, the deficit alone right now is greater than what it took to run the entire country for a, a period of, of a year back in 1996. And it's something that you, you can't continue doing. I, I believe that the spending has gone so out of of line that people, it's not really believable, it's not possible that people think that this could be happening. Uh, President Obama has managed to increase federal spending by over 30 percent to an average of $3.6 trillion a year. $3.6 trillion. Well, I was complaining about $1.5 trillion. This is $3.5 trillion. And it's just 15 years later. Now, where is, where is, is anyone listening out there? Doesn't anyone really care? Uh, maybe since I have 20 kids and grandkids, I'm a little more sensitive to the, the uh, fiscal destruction of this country. The, uh, the, this has caused our national debt to increase by 35 percent. Today we have to borrow 40 cents for every dollar we spend. And it just happened. And this is something that, that we've, we've got to address. I think we're so wrapped up now in saying how we're going to get by the, this, this, uh, this deadline of the 2nd of August. I'd like to remind everyone something that most people don't know. It's shocking they don't know it. They, they think that this is the first time in the Obama administration that we have talked about increasing the debt limit. It's not. It's the fourth time. 
And so what he does is keep on coming up with the uh, trillions of dollars of deficit each time, $5 trillion in three budgets. And believe me, it's not anyone else in this chamber. It's not in the other chamber the, in the House. It's one person, the President of the United States, has come out with his budget. That's his budget. He signs it, and he sends it to us. Well, that's a, a total of $5 trillion over the last three budgets, and it's just not a possible thing that, that this could be happening. And so this being the fourth time that he's wanted to increase the deficit, this is the strategy. You go out and you spend all this money like uh, the drunken sailors, and then you come right up to the last minute and say the world's going to come to an end unless you increase the debt limit. You've got to stop someplace. And I decided uh, last time he did this that I was going to stop unless we had some type of discipline. And the only discipline I can see that's out there is the uh, cut cap and trade and, and the balanced budget uh, amendment. And I, I think that we need to take look at this really carefully because... Uh, uh, if you stop and, and put this down, I, what I normally do on something like this is I see how does this affect the average person? Th this increase just in this period of time is it would be a eleven thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child increase from the time that this president took office. Now that's an increase. The total amount that they would owe would be forty-six thousand dollars. That's the day that they're born. Happy birthday. Well, in the, over the past several weeks, we've talked about uh, what to do about the debt limit, and I've looked at all the plans. There are three major plans out there, uh, and I've, uh, I'm looking carefully. The, the problem I have with the plan that has come up that's called the, the Gang of Six or the Gang of Seven, depending on which time you're, which group you're looking at, uh, is that it has some, uh, some intangibles in there. For example, the cuts, the military cuts, it doesn't say where they are, but we're talking about it uh, around, what, a billion dollars? Nine hundred billion, uh, almost a trillion dollars over a period of ten years. Now, I'm on the Armed Services Committee, and I can tell you right now, I don't know where that's going to come from. And so that's a problem, until they come up with more specifics, and they might do it, and it might be perfectly plausible. But as it is right now, the, the, um, the cut, cap, and balance is the only one that I've seen that would really work. And I haven't been involved in, the, in all these discussions. A lot of people have been involved. Those certainly are working to try to come up with the answers. The ones going down to the White House every other day and talking with the president. That's why I don't happen to be one of those. My major concern right now, and I, I would at least mention this, uh, I've done several shows today to try to let people understand, make people understand, yes, the deficit and the spending, all that is terrible. But what is equally as bad that nobody knows about is what's happening in terms of the regulations. Uh, you know, we have all these programs that, that, uh, that uh, the, th this administration has tried to pass. I would say the main one that people are familiar with is cap and trade. You remember the old thing that's been going on for 10 years now? And the cap and trade would cost the American people somewhere between three and four hundred billion dollars a year. Now, that's a huge thing. Again, bringing that figure down to my, for every taxpaying family in my state of Oklahoma, that would be a little over $3,000 a year. And you get nothing for it. According to uh, the president's own director of the Environmental Protection Agency, Lisa Jackson, when I asked her on the record, uh, would this, if we were to pass any of these cap and trade bills, uh, would this reduce CO2 emissions? Assuming you want to reduce CO2 emissions. She said, no, because this is only applied in the United States, and I would carry it one step further. As we run out of ways to create energy in America, we would have a job flight from our manufacturing base that would have to go to places like, like China and like India and like uh, Mexico, where they don't really have any emission uh, restrictions. So it would, if anything, increase emissions. Nonetheless, uh, in, in fact, I would say this, I'm very proud of the United States Senate, because now they have perhaps, at the very most, 24 votes to pass a cap and trade. So what does the president do? He says, fine, we'll do it through regulations. So through regulations, he's attempting to do that. And we're going to hear next week just another example. I could name, and I, in fact, there are six major areas where regulations are costing hundreds of billions of dollars. But another one he's going to announce next week is going to be tightening the standards on, on, on NACs and it's, it's going to be one that is going to be co costing in the neighborhood of $90 billion each year. So just in two of these regulations, you have 
$400 billion a year that it's costing the American people. And, and people just aren't aware of it. You know, I, I've, uh, someone, some smart guy in my office went back and he said, you know, you're not the first person to be concerned about these regulations and the cost of regulations. Politicians don't talk about it because no one understands it. But Ronald Reagan back in 1981, I'm reading right now, uh, this is a quote, he said, overregulation causes small and independent business men and women as well as large businesses to defer or terminate plans for expansion. And that's when he said, I have asked Vice President Bush, that was the first Bush, to head a cabinet level task force on regulatory relief. So they realized it back then, the cost of overregulation. And it's, become to the, it's come to the point now where it's every bit as important as just the spending problem. But we're talking about the spending problem right now. And there's nothing really complicated about it. You spend more than we take in, you go into debt. And we can't keep doing that forever. And as long as we keep getting these budgets from the president uh, each year, three budgets now, totaling a greater increase in debt than all presidents since George Washington combined. But nobody seems to understand. No one seems to care. We're going to have to do something about it for our future generations. And we, we're, we're going to do it. Uh, I just hope that when this vote comes up, and I think it's been set, I believe it's set for, for tomorrow on the uh, cap and balance, that this would be something that will be seriously considered. I would say particularly by people who are coming up for re-election in 2012, you ought to be thinking about this because this is going to be a huge issue. To stand here on the floor in this, in this crisis that we're facing now and not vote for a balanced budget amendment is going to be something that you're going to have to answer to the people. So while the caps that we talk about, and, and of course we're talking about uh, cuts, caps, and balance, uh, that would be uh, over a period of time. It's no good unless you have some kind of enforcing mechanism. This bill that we'll be voting on tomorrow, I understand, does have that enforcement mechanism. It has sequestrations. It has those are automatic cuts so that the, uh, uh, if Congress decides that they're going to spend above the caps that are allowed, then automatic sequestration goes into effect. And it works. It's enforceable. You know, the... Uh, We've watched the spending go up, and I, I'm reminiscent that this has been going on for a long time. People are saying, well, we're not going to be able to pass a cut, cap, and, and balanced budget because they've been trying to pass a balanced budget amendment for some 40 years or so, and they haven't been able to do it. I think this is the unique time that's different than the, the past 40 years. This is the first time that I've seen where the average person knows you can't sustain this thing. You can't go from a budget running in the United, the United States of America for uh, uh, one and a half trillion dollars, and then all of a sudden it's three and a half trillion dollars, all due to one president. You can't continue to do that. And I can remember way back many, many years ago when I was in the state legislature, there was a, 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 a great senator named Carl Curtis from uh, Nebraska. Carl Curtis was a, a quite elderly at that time, and he had been trying to do a balanced budget amendment, amendment for probably 20 years at that time. This is back in the 70s. But he came to me in the state legislature in Oklahoma. He said, I got an idea. He said, the argument they use against a balanced budget amendment is the states, three-fourths of the states will never ratify it. So he said, let's pre-ratify a, a budget balancing amendment. It's kind of ingenious. And uh, he came to me. I happened to be the first uh, state that he came to. And he said, will you take this on as a project? So we actually, in my state of Oklahoma, were the first state in the history to pre-ratify a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. It was really kind of fun. And then others, it was so popular that others started doing it. And we got right up to the, the, the uh, three-fourths and didn't quite get over that. But that's something that took place. It took place many years ago. So this is something that we know is not easy, something that's difficult to do. But now we have another chance. It's the first time we've had a chance where the majority of the people, by polling, show that they are they're outraged, they, we're going to have to do something. And even though we've raised the debt limit countless times, this is the one time that's getting all the, all the attention. And it's getting the attention because we have sustained, we have something that is no longer sustainable. We've got another chance. 
The Mellon's budget minimum provision in the cut cap and balance would prevent the debt limit from being raised until Congress sends one of the three balanced budget amendment proposals to the states for ratification. In other words, the amendment would have to pass both chambers by a two-thirds majority before the debt limit is allowed to increase. This makes sense. It's a permanent solution to our problem. Within five years of ratification, the amendment would require con Congress to pass a balanced budget every year, and it would cap total spending at 18 percent of GDP. Right now, it's hovering around 20 percent of GDP. So it's even lower than the, than the caps that we've had before. It would also require a two-thirds majority to raise taxes. We all know that this conditions could change. We could be in a war, and, and this does have that provision, which I think is very responsible. The balance of budget uh, amendment is the only reform that will put our nation on a true path to, uh, for permanent fiscal stability. It will force comprehensive and real changes to the federal government and its spending priorities. And if, if it's ratified, it would remove the risk of a debt crisis. In short, it would put our nation on a path uh, to limited government that it has not seen in years. So I, I really think that this is the opportunity. Uh, we have three different opportunities coming up. Uh, we've heard about the the proposal by the leader and, and by, I think, the uh, majority leader also that might be some kind of a last effort, and, and maybe that's uh, what we'd be considering. But the first and the best and the easiest and the fiscally most responsible is the cap, uh, 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 cut cap and, and balance. So we'll have that opportunity uh, tomorrow. It's very significant. We take advantage of that opportunity, and uh, I believe I'm not the pessimist that most people are. I think we've got a shot at this thing. If the American people are watching carefully, we could pass this thing. I appreciate that, and I yield the floor.